Okay, so uh, again, welcome everyone. Uh, this is the fifth lecture in the Expanding Empathy 2021 lecture series. Uh, it's being hosted uh, by the Rock Ethics Institute, uh, where I spearhead the Moral Agency and Moral Development Initiative. Um, so I'm, yeah, this is also being co-sponsored by the psychology departments here at Penn State and also the Edna Bennett Pierce Prevention Research Center. And I want to introduce uh, Dr. Ben Bavel, who's an associate professor of psychology and neuroscience at New York University, and he directs the Social Identity and Morality Lab. Um, he got his PhD at the University of Toronto, did a postdoc at Ohio State University before joining NYU. Uh, he has a number of accolades uh, that I'll briefly outline his background for you before we get started. Uh, he received the NYU Golden Dozen Teaching Award for his teaching. Uh, and more broadly, his research focuses on how collective concerns like group identities, moral values, and political beliefs shape mind, brain, and behavior, uh, drawing upon a lot of different uh, techniques and methods from across areas of psychology and neuroscience. Um, he's published uh, extensively over 100 academic publications and written essays in places like the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Scientific American. Uh, one thing I'm familiar with that I regularly read, it's a mentoring column. He writes in a, a science magazine called Letters to Young Scientists. I highly recommend you all check it out if you get the chance. Um, he's published in many of the field's top journals and also received many of our field's top awards. So for example, the Sage Young Scholars Award in Social and Personality Psychology. Also early uh, distinguished contributions as a young investigator from the Society for Social and Neuroscience. Um, the Janet T. Spence Award for Transformative Early Career Contributions from the Association of Psychological Science, uh, the Gordon Alport Intergroup Relations Prize, and the SPSB Dan Wagner Theoretical Innovation Prize. I'm probably missing a few, but the key point is that uh, his work has been very uh, well received in the field and has been uh, rightly recognized. And he's also received a number of grants from the NSF, Russell Sage Foundation, SPSB, John Templeton Foundation, and many others. And so it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Jay here to talk with us. Uh, the first few talks of the series have focused on how we make trade-offs about empathy for different targets, different groups. Uh, and I think what's interesting about this talk, you know, he'll elaborate today, is how we scale things up and consider, especially during this pandemic, COVID-19, uh, how do we scale up questions of empathy and concern for one of the greatest collective problems we faced in uh, many, many years. So thank you again for joining us and uh, turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Daryl. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here to talk about how we construct our moral circles and what motivates us to make sacrifices for other people uh, in a crisis like the pandemic. And so I'm gonna tell you about a research that really we've launched into in the last year uh, in my lab. I was just looking at Facebook yesterday and you know you get those memories of where you were a year ago two years ago and yesterday was when um new york city where i live was in complete lockdown and i had taken a video with my kids as we were locked essentially in our apartment of everybody coming out of their windows and cheering at 7 p.m every night which became a ritual here uh for the medical staff the doctors the nurses um people who were frontline workers during the early stages of the pandemic where uh people were dying at huge rates especially in, in the city and uh, since then, it's been a global catastrophe. So we were one of the first hotspots, um, but it has spread across the country and across the globe. And so partly because of having lived through it in that early stage and really but not being able to think or, or do really anything else, I threw myself into trying to understand the psychology behind uh, what motivates people to do the right thing during the pandemic. And one of the areas that I work is really at the intersection of group identity and morality. And so I'm going to talk to you about how that can be a good thing and a bad thing in a pandemic. Um, but before I do, I want to kind of zip back 100 years to the end of the last global pandemic of, of this scale, which was the Spanish flu. And there was a paper published in Science Magazine in 1919 uh, that attempted to make uh, draw some lessons from that particular devastating pandemic. And, and if you have ever seen the data, many of us are aware of it now, 650,000 Americans, uh, where I stand today, where many of you are from, uh, died during that pandemic. So it was an absolute catastrophe. And this paper uh, briefly summarized kind of the social and behavioral science of this. They found that people do not really appreciate the risks they run. You know, they're spreading the disease without being aware of it. 
They, uh, it often goes against human nature for people to shut themselves up in rigid isolation as a means of protecting others. So our instinct socially as social animals is to reach out and help people, um, to comfort them when they're in distress, uh, to go over to their place if they're suffering or to go to the hospital if, if, if something really bad happens to them. And really you couldn't do any of these during a pandemic. In fact, that would put other people and yourselves at danger. Um, and then the last thing was that people often unconsciously act as a continuing danger to themselves and others. Um, and so this kind of tapped into something that really became a big idea in the last 20 or 30 years in psychology that many of our instincts and intuitions are often unconscious. And so we might be doing things but not fully understanding the motives and rationale why. Um, and of course, all of these are critical to understand because to flatten the curve in the absence of a vaccine for the past year, we've really relied on our capacity to mobilize collective action. And what we need people to do is a number of things. You know, in the early stages, it was about washing your hands. Um, you know, and then it became things like shutting down travel, um, avoiding public gatherings, um, canceling your events, figuring out how to work from home. All of these things are things we've done to try to mitigate the spread of the pandemic. And many of us have been doing them now for a year. Um, and if we do them all, you know, then it, uh, you know, not only saves a lot of lives, including our own, but our neighbors, our family members, especially elderly people, vulnerable people. Um, and, and if we do it well enough, we stay below hospital capacity, and then at least the hospital staff can do the best they can to help the people there. Um, and so when this all started happening and we started thinking about this need for this collective response, I gathered a group of uh, scientists across the social and behavioral sciences. Uh, in many different areas of study to try to figure out what might we be able to glean from the past, you know, 100 years of social and behavioral science that we thought would be relevant to this particular pandemic. And we thought there was a lot of things at play, but I'm going to talk about a couple of them. And, and a key theme that emerged across a lot of different sections was the role of, of groups and identity. So you need good leadership and especially identity leadership, people mobilizing a group around a shared purpose. And there has to be trust and compliance often for that to work. Um, you have to set good social norms, and part of that happens from leaders, but also from your neighbors and family members. Um, political polarization can be a problem in that context because it means maybe groups aren't listening to each other or they're taking advice from different people. Um, and there could also be consequences for your ability to persuade people for the spread of conspiracy theories uh, and the need for social, or social connection during these periods can be uh, also motivate certain actions. And so uh, very early in the pandemic, you started to see very different styles to managing groups. And so even though a lot of countries started to shut their borders uh, and flights to and from certain countries, it really, the response was really managed at a national level in most places. Um, and so national leaders stepped up and made decisions about things like that and closing borders, medical responses. And um, to, uh, just to draw a contrast that came out across many stories was, the leadership of uh, New Zealand's Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern and uh, the leadership in the USA by Donald Trump. And um, she was credited for being the most effective leader on the planet by the Atlantic Monthly and, and Trump was excoriated for his leadership. But I don't just bring up this contrast because I'm making it, but Trump himself uh, made it. So he uh, pointed out that she was um, responsible for a big surge in COVID-19. And then she responded that that was patently wrong. And so um, there was a big conflict between the two of them about their differing leadership styles and which would be most effective during the pandemic. So I'm gonna lay out some of the, some of the leadership styles and then what some of the data suggests. Um, so this is a brief summary of some of the early leadership modeling and role modeling and rhetoric in the US. We have it totally under control, it's one person coming in from China. We think we have it very well under control. We pretty much shut it down coming in from China. You know, in April, supposedly it dies with the hotter weather. When it gets warm, uh, historically, that has been able to kill the virus. The people are getting better. They're all getting better. And the 15 within a couple of days is gonna be down to close to zero. It's going to disappear. One day it's like a miracle, it will disappear. And you'll be fine. Uh, they're gonna have vaccines, I think, relatively soon. Not only the vaccines, but the therapies. Therapies is sort of another word for cure. You're talking about very small numbers in the United States. Our numbers are lower than just about anybody. It's really working out and a lot of good things are going to happen and we are responding with great speed and professionalism it's going to go away yeah no i don't take responsibility at all we're going to all be great we're going to be so good this came up it, it, we came up so suddenly this is a pandemic i felt it was a pandemic long before it was called a pandemic all you got to do is look at other countries the coronavirus you know that right? coronavirus 
Uh, this is their new hoax. We have 15 people in this massive country. And because of the fact that we went early, we went early, we could have had a lot more than that. We're doing great. Our country is doing so great. Okay, so at this point in time, this video was, was cut in March, early March, and by then there was 5,000 cases in the US and you could see it growing exponentially. As of last week, we hit over 30 million cases. So kind of presaged the, the direction of the yeah. pandemic response here. But I wanna um, apologize to Donald Trump because this particular ad has been critiqued as being partisan because it, it spliced a couple of his comments and took one out of context to make it say, seem like he was saying that the coronavirus was a, was a hoax, um, a democratic hoax. Um, in, in fact, he was saying that democratic concerns about the coronavirus and the media's concerns about it were a hoax, um, not that the virus itself was, was a hoax. And so you can see how even trying to capture his meaning uh, got kind of filtered through a polarized lens. Um, around the same time, he was saying that it was a democratic hoax, um, concerns about it. Joe Biden was writing uh, for an op-ed for the USA Today about how Trump was the worst possible leader to deal with the coronavirus outbreak. And, and this was months before, or a very long time, many weeks before, um, actually, I think months before uh, Biden was the Democratic nominee. So he wasn't even the Democratic nominee at this point. Now he's the president, obviously. Um, but these two uh, prominent party members and uh, presidents now um, were talking uh, in a you know in a very different way about the pandemic. And there was already uh, allegations that Trump was going to mishandle it long before he actually did uh, handle it at all or mishandle it. Um, and this isn't just uh, an issue of polarization at the party leader level. Um, the rhetoric and the coverage of uh, the pandemic, it turns out, matters a lot in terms of media members. And so there's a number of studies suggesting that uh, exposure to uh, platforms like Fox News might make you less concerned about the pandemic. So in the early days, um, people who in particular are watching shows like Sean Hannity's show, which was very skeptical about the pandemic, uh, were less likely to take the virus seriously than people who watched um, Tucker Carlson, who was taking the pandemic and the virus more seriously. And so they were, you know, even among Fox viewers, there's different lenses of reality about the actual risk. And this mattered a lot in the early part of the pandemic, as you can see in January, February, and March, there's a big gap in perceptions of risk between people who watch these two shows. And so a lot of this is just basically getting filtered in something that we've seen happen over the last few decades, really last 40 years of increasing polarization in the US, not only among party leaders and uh, at mainstream media outlets, but also in uh, the ideology of regular voters. And so the median Democrat and median Republican tend to differ a lot more on political issues. And that's only been pulling apart. Uh, news, new data I saw a couple weeks ago suggested the worst point in 40 years. Um, and it's not just that they differ on opinion, it's there's uh, what's known as affective polarization. They just simply dislike each other. And in fact, some data suggests over the last 40 years that uh, you, now the emergence of out party hate is a stronger force than in party love in terms of what motivates people to engage in political action. A lot of times they vote for somebody simply because they despise the other party or the other leader. And they might not even like their party or leader that much. And so out party hate can get them to do things that they might not even agree with uh, simply out of fear or spite towards other party. And so that becomes incredibly dangerous when you're trying to use messaging to be effective. And uh, what my research has tried to look at is how this type of identity and intergroup dynamic changes how we're filtering information that's you know, coming in through our eyes and senses and we're trying to make sense of it in our brain. Um, and it can bias if we're, we're highly motivated to perceive uh, information through the lens of our identities because you know, we wanna to belong to a certain group um, and we want our group to have status and win and be correct. We wanna be morally righteous. We wanna defend a certain type of system. Those types of things can motivate us to uh, twist information or uh, select certain information sources, go to certain news sites, um, believe certain uh, pundits over others. And um, that doesn't matter a lot. So the example that I used originally was how this plays into judgments about crowd size. Um, it turns out that probably just people are expressing, you know, they think Trump's crowd was larger than Obama's um, to express a certain party identity. Um, and, and that doesn't matter really at all for anything. It's not gonna harm anybody, um, but it will harm people in the context of something like a pandemic. Uh, if we don't share a common sense of reality what the risks involved, might 
uh, dramatically increase our own risk and our risk of our family and friends and community um, in the context of a deadly virus. And so this was one of the very first patterns you started to see early on in the pandemic, as early as the data that was collected on this in, or in February, um, found that there was a huge partisan gap. So in every single state, the Democrats in that state were more uh, concerned about the coronavirus than Republicans in that state. And you might think like, well, in the early stages, the pandemic started in places like New York and Seattle. Uh, maybe people living in those states, uh, even if they're Republican, might come face to face with the risks and decide, oh, this is actually bad. Um, but no, even in the least concerned Democratic state, Minnesota, they were still far more concerned than Republicans in the most concerned states like Washington and New Jersey. And so this just shows you how powerful partisanship was when people were at least responding to surveys about this. Um, of course, some people thought maybe this was not going to be a big deal, that Republicans don't trust uh, political scientists and survey makers, and therefore they're going to say something because it aligns with the, what their political leader is saying on TV, but they might be taking the risk seriously in, in private. And uh, that's what some data suggested from Google searches so on the privacy of people's own homes. Um, at first, Democrats were searching for things like hand sanitizer more on their Google searches, um, but a political scientist came along and analyzed it and found, you know, after a couple of weeks as the pandemic started to spread and things started to shut down, that partisan gap went away, at least in searches of hand sanitizer. I mean, I mean, at this point, we understand hand sanitizer is not really that important for dealing with the pandemic, but at the time, it was one of the key issues. And so this suggested maybe people were engaging in what political scientists call cheap talk, just saying, Republicans were just saying that they weren't taking the pandemic seriously, but in private, maybe they were. Um, and so I started to write about all this, and normally I wouldn't post an op-ed in a talk, but this was kind of my first summary of the literature and talking about theoretically what will happen if we have political polarization. Um, that it could actually be deadly and that there's reason to take it seriously. And so this was over a year ago now, before the pandemic had really gotten bad in most parts of the US. Um, and at that time, a former undergraduate student of mine, who's now a PhD student at Yale, Anton Golitzer, saw my article and emailed me and said, we can test this with real behavior. And he uh, had access to geo-tracking data from 15 million smartphones per day over uh, more than a year. So we could see how much movement had changed compared to that same group of people the previous year. Um, and this data, by the way, is being collected all the time as you move around the world on your smartphone if, and your apps, unless you, unless you actively know how to turn it off. Um, we didn't get individual cell phones data, so the data is anonymized. No one's uh, personal identity was revealed to us when we got this data, just if there's any concerns. But we got it at the aggregate level, so we could look at the state level and county level um, to see, on average, in those states or counties, are people moving less than the previous year? And this type of data has been really critical to track movement throughout this, the pandemic. So the New York Times has had a number of really interesting articles showing the movement of people um, and how this accounted for the spread epidemiologically of the coronavirus and virologists have been using this information, epidemiologists. And so we wanted to use it to test questions that are germane to issues like social and behavioral science. And um, what we found is that as you went from early March into especially late April when people, things started to shut down, people uh, engage in more social distancing. So as you go up on the y-axis in both of these graphs, that means that uh, counties of individuals were less likely to be moving than they were the previous year. So social distancing was happening. And if you look at these little spikes on the reduction in general movement, the graph on the left, that's every weekend. So you can just kind of have good face validity of this. Every weekend, people just are able to stay at home as they do normally. But especially if they have a work on a frontline job, at least on the weekend, they can engage in distancing. Um, some people unfortunately have to work uh, throughout this. And then you can see by Memorial Day in May, late May, social distancing has largely gone away. People are, are ready to go out. The pandemic, had, the curve had been flattened in most parts of the country by then. And the weather was nice and people wanted to start their summer uh, vacations and things. And so social distancing, at least in the US, uh, completely stopped. It was right around 0%. So in other words, they were moving about as much as they were compared to the previous year by, May, by late May. Um, when we started to look at how this happened in red states or blue states, we found a really striking pattern. Uh, and it was replicated at the county level with over 3,000 counties, which is that blue counties were much more likely to engage in social distancing than red counties. So counties that voted for Clinton in 2016 were much more likely to engage in social distancing than counties that voted for Trump. Um, the other thing that really struck us was that this partisan gap 
got bigger as the pandemic went along. And we had expected, certainly I wrote in, in, in my, one of my predictions was that as people, more people learn about the pandemic, it, it affects more states and more cities and more counties. You should expect the partisan gap to go away. There should be what's called a reality constraint on their differing perceptions and behavior. Um, but we didn't find that. In fact, we found that the partisan gap got bigger. And not only that, we looked at all kinds of variables, uh, looked like economics, population density, all kinds of things you might think would affect movement. And partisanship was one of not only one of the biggest predictors out of anything we looked at, over and above all the others, um, but it was one of the most robust. No matter how we ran our statistical models, it was uh, powerfully significant. So this suggests that partisanship was playing a big role here um, on its own or over and above all these other factors, no matter how you uh, carve up the data. And if you look at counties that voted for Trump over Clinton, they exhibited on average 14% less spatial distancing. Um, however, I should also note that the counties that voted were, that were very red, deep red counties, were the least likely to distance. So it wasn't just that there was a red versus blue difference. It was a question of how red it was predicted, uh, how much or how little social distancing they engaged in. Um, and so it was also a categorical effect at the state and county level, but also a continuous effect. Um, we also looked at what counties were watching on TV. And what we found is that counties that were watching Fox News uh, relative to mainstream media like CNN and MSNBC uh, were associated with the highest levels of movement or the least dis social distancing. In fact, this almost accounted for our entire effect. So partisanship is filtered through exposure to partisan media, especially uh, widely watched mainstream media. Um, so this suggests that it's not just, you know, people are, are, are not just making this up on their own, they're absorbing the information ecosphere that they're exposed to. So the communications and political science of this matter a great deal. Um, and then you can see, if you look over time in the US, that these spikes in red states um, in terms of actual infections uh, increased and they increased the most in the solid or far or darkest red states. And so you can see, as we moved into the summer, July, August, and into the fall, September, October, the strongest spikes in infection on average were in the reddest states. Um, and so we wanted to look at this in our own data. And we looked, you know, uh, shortly, so for us to look at like, did this distancing effect, was it associated with future infections? We had to look a few days later because your movement is not necessarily gonna show up in a positive COVID test for many days because it takes four to five days to express symptoms after you get exposed to someone who's, car who's a carrier. Um, and then a few days later, often to get a test and then have it returned to you. So you see this uh, increase in infections from uh, uh, lack of reduction in spatial distancing, you know, uh, roughly two weeks later. And then if you look even about a week or two after that, you see a time lagged, uh, lagged effect of more mortality. So places that were not engaging in social distancing were more likely to not only have more people infected, but an increase in mortality rates. And so we had our data from May, but you can start to see this here, having potentially cascading effects through the late summer and into the fall. Um, because of course, the more people get infected, then the more at risk everybody else is in a place. Um, and so you can see this partisan gap, um, although we just saw it in movement, it led to this increase in infections in red states and counties, which were often less populous and, and uh, less dense uh, and so and didn't often have major airports and were in hubs of travel internationally and so even though places like New York which tend to lean very blue uh, and Seattle were hit hard very early on as the pandemic grew you see a huge spike in red states um, and and this was even as the threat became more real and as there was endless coverage and much more scientific knowledge and uh, clear guidelines about how to respond to it you also you might think that political actors political elites like Trump um, and uh, members of Congress and the Senate um, maybe were taking this seriously themselves. In fact, there was leaked audio from Trump, I think it was with uh, Carl Bernstein, if I recall, uh, saying he knew that there was a big threat with COVID, but he didn't want to tell people. So you might think that political leaders should know better, have the best access to uh, the resources to protect themselves, um, but they might not be true believers themselves. But if you look at the known infections in the Senate and House, this was an analysis, I think it was the New York Times that did this. Um, they found that Republicans in Congress, in the Senate and House of Representatives, were far more likely to get uh, COVID 
than Democrats. And so it suggests that these leaders were internalized and absorbing these messages as well. So this isn't just an artifact of their followers. It seems to operate at every level of the hierarchy. And obviously, uh, Trump himself and his family uh, were, and the entire White House were, were, had several super spreader events and were infected. Um, so it might seem like, okay, well, that's the past, you know, we're getting vaccinated now. But if you look at polls, um, up into polls very recently, the data shows repeatedly that partisanship is now the biggest predictor of vaccine attitudes in the US. Um, and so what this means is Republicans are about 40% less likely to uh, have positive attitudes towards the vaccines. Um, and not only is partisanship, uh, the partisanship effect huge, but it's bigger than any other demographic. It's bigger than age, it's bigger than gender, it's bigger than race, which has been a major concern. Uh, obviously black and Hispanic communities have very hard and, and in early stages had a lot of distrust of the vaccines. Um, that gap has almost completely closed now. Um, and, and education is not driving this. In fact, the partisan effect is bigger than education. You might think that's a role. Um, so partisanship seems to be bigger than all of these, in fact, much bigger. And, and uh, the recent poll I saw from a couple weeks ago suggests that even as these other gaps have closed and even as more people on average want to get vaccinated, um, the partisan gap itself has grown bigger <laughs> because the people who are democratic or left-leaning are improving their attitudes towards the vaccines quicker than Republicans. Um, and so this is gonna be a big issue going forward. This is not the end of this, unfortunately, because if you don't reach herd immunity, um, you're gonna have a continued uh, pandemic. You're also gonna potentially have more mutations and variants that might be vaccine resistant. And so, and those might be more likely in red areas, but you know, Americans are intermixed and mingle and this could have uh, consequences for everybody. Um, and, and a lot of people, I have colleagues who are political scientists who thought, well, this is just political ideology. This is just how conservatives approach the world. Um, and, and so there's not really good data on this because conservatism and, and Republican identity are highly confounded in the US, but you can get a couple good glimpses at this. And so one is that if you look back to the last epidemic, which was Ebola, um, there were surveys looking at uh, the extent to which people were concerned who were Democrats and Republicans. And what you saw during Ebola was the exact opposite pattern. In this case, uh, Republicans were more concerned than Democrats. Um, and what was different about Ebola, obviously it wasn't as bad, but the other big difference was that a Democrat was president. And so what it suggests is that people's concerns are partly determined by who's in office. It much, that seems to matter, and the message that person is giving much more than they are uh, by their political ideology. So I would, this data suggests that the, this effect is really about partisanship and identity and not about ideology. Um, so the question here, where this is part of a lecture series on empathy, can we do something to start to close some of these uh, partisan fractures and gaps? Um, and, and I think you can. And so first of all, if you look, this will go back to the first debate we had about leadership styles between uh, Donald Trump and Jacinda Ardern. Um, it's now clear we have a year of data and we can go, and I pulled this data up about 10 minutes before this talk as I was loading my slides to see what, what the data look like here. And what you can see is that the US has more deaths than any country on earth. Um, New Zealand has 26. In fact, New Zealand is the flat line at the bottom of this figure that you can't even see because the deaths are so few and far between. Um, and so, and of course you can adjust this for population and the US is still orders of magnitude more, uh, has, has mishandled it and had more deaths than New Zealand. So it's not a, just an issue of, of population. Um, so what is it about different countries that have handled it much better um, than the US? Um, one thing that we predicted when we wrote our very first paper on this, this that Nature Human Behavior paper, was that a key thing will be the leadership style. And we predicted in particular that leaders uh, who follow kind of the model of identity leadership uh, where they promote trust leading to cooperation, create a sense of shared identity, um, will create a sense that we're all in this together. And if you have been following international politics as much as I have, you'll know that Jacinda Ardern embodies this. Um, so she was famous for locking, putting herself on lockdown um, and calling the New Zealanders her team of 5 million people. So she used the language of identity leadership. She engaged in the behaviors. In fact, there was a famous thing where they started to reopen after they had flattened the curve and restaurants were reopening and she went out to go for a brunch. And um, they had distanced all the tables in the restaurant and she wanted a brunch table. And normally when your prime minister or president comes, you make room for them and there's, you know, they're there and you maybe get a photo op out of it, good publicity for your restaurant. And the restaurant said, well, we're distanced. 
were following the guidelines. And so she, instead of forcing them to make a table for her, trying to crowd her way in, she left, um, not wanting to break the rules that she had set for people, um, for public health. And then they found space, eventually other people left, and then they like let her in and she sat and she followed the rules. And so this is very different than from some countries. Uh, a, this prominent, prominently happened in Britain where um, Dominic Cummins violated the guidelines uh, for the pandemic and uh, by traveling in the middle of it when the citizens were supposed to be locked down and uh, got exposed. And then the prime minister Boris Johnson came out and defended him. And uh, one of my collaborators on this paper was on the, the, the team of experts consulting with the, the British and UK government and um, resigned in protest because he thought it was such a, a, it violated all the principles of how to create a sense of all in this together that you have to put your, as a leader, you have to take the same steps. If you want to get efficacy and hope and, and action at a collective level, you have to embody that as a leader. And then contrast that also with the US who, you know, Trump had many super spreader events and huge rallies um, in the middle of the pandemic. And so um, we contrasted these types of approaches in our paper um, as senses of uh, uh, leadership that focused on building a common sense of we're all in this together versus focusing more on say an inflated belief in national greatness um, rather than focusing on how we're all gonna work through this together and make sacrifices. And, and leaders and individuals who are focused on, have a greater uh, focus on defending the image rather than caring for their citizens is what's known as, or in the literature is what we refer to as collective narcissism. Uh, and so we wanted to see, does this manifest uh, in, in bad responses during the pandemic? And so we ran this study um, and we have collaborators at Penn State, including Daryl Cameron and, and uh, his lab. And we launched this national uh, cooperative study. We framed it as a chance for shared identity um, during the early stages of the pandemic. So I posted this on April 11th and invited anybody around the world who wanted to join us and uh, collect data on this and see what we could find that was going to predict the, the right type of self-sacrifice you know, uh, behavior to benefit other people. And um, we're gonna have many papers that come of it, but the first paper that we're looking at and, and uh, putting together, it's currently under revision. So it's not quite out yet, but hopefully soon. Um, it, it we received uh, interest from 233 scholars around the world from 67 countries. And we got data in those countries with a sample of over 46,500 people. And we wanted to see whether national identity, people identification with their country um, predicted these, uh, you know, these collective behaviors that at the time we thought would be associated with uh, mitigating and flattening the curve, mitigating the pandemic. So physical distancing, physical hygiene, policy support for lockdowns and reduced travel. Um, and we wanted to see if this differs from say people who are high in national narcissism. Um, and we also wanted to look at political ideology because we couldn't look at it in our distancing behavior. So we looked at it here. And we wanted to see, we can put all these in the same model and see what predicts people following the rules. Um, and this is just a sample of the countries we got and the size of the sample is in, in different parts of the world. So it wasn't a fully global study, I wish it was, but um, it was data was collected in a few months and we're incredibly grateful for everybody who was able to get data. And the data we got is from countries representing over 4 billion people. And at least in 20 of these countries we were able to get representative samples. So that means they're stratified by uh, key risk factors for the pandemic, like age and gender. Um, so we translated and back translated all the materials into these countries and when we analyzed it what we found one of the most uh, robust effects we found is that national identification predicts support for all these public health measures um, in in pretty much every single country on every single public health measure so physical conduct uh, policy support and hygiene national identity positively predicted uh, support for those things and you can see it's hard, it's higher in some countries so Denmark was our country that had you know, the more nationally identified you are um, with the country of Denmark, the more you're will, willing to support pretty much all of these. Um, United States actually ends up pretty high on this. Um, people who are identified as, as Americans were more willing to engage in these things. Um, and if you look at just the, here's a kind of a heat map of the effects around the world. So the redder countries are countries where the effect is stronger. And so I'll just highlight here uh, the effects of national identification. You can just see there's redness in pretty much every country where we have data in, on all of these measures. Um, you can see with national narcissism, the row below it, there's some countries that are blue, some that are red. Um, 
And so, in, in, for example, in the US, you can see the opposite pattern here, where the higher you score in national narcissism, the less likely you, you are willing to uh, support these public health measures. And, and that's pretty interesting because national narcissism and national identification are, are moderately correlated. They're cor correlated about 0 0.4, 0 0.5. Um, but when you tease them out, they're doing opposite things. Um, so kind of people who identify their country but aren't concerned with national uh, image management but are willing to engage in self-sacrifice where the people who are concerned about image management of the country's greatness are not. You can also see this for Brazil, um, which is also another place that has kind of a populist leader that they have the highest rate, I think, per capita of, of mortality in the world. And we have collaborators here in Brazil. Um, and so they are arguably maybe have mismanaged it, the pandemic worse in the US at this point. Uh, with ideology, the effects are really small and a little bit all over the place, but on average, blue means that the more liberal leaning countries in particular really supported policy support. So liberals are more willing to support policy structural changes to address it, um, but they're not really any higher on physical hygiene or contact. Um, and then, so I'll say this, a reviewer, <laughs> we got pushback from a couple of reviewers who said, this is nice. This is just a bunch of self-report measures. You know, you have 46,000 people, 67 countries, um, but we want to see some real behavior. Um, can you look at real movement like we did in the earlier study I showed you? And so we, in this last week, uh, as part of our revision process, um, we're able to find measures of national identification from the World Value Survey um, at the country level and measures of movement at the country level using, uh, Google now has this distance, uh, anybody can access their distance data. So you can look at each country and how much movement has been reduced over the past year. And so we did this during the same time frame around April and May, when we collected the self-report data, we looked at movement in April and May and compared it to movement from the previous year. And so we can see where movement has been reduced at the country level, is that associated with countries where national identification is higher in the World Value Survey? And um, that's exactly what we found. We found a really robust effect. It was a correlation of 0.4. Um, and once we averaged across all distance measures and a couple different measures of uh, national identification, um, entirely consistent with what we saw in our massive international survey. And so you can see on average, the more you identify with a country, um, and so the question here is, is it uh, not important for me to know about science in my daily life uh, from clearly disagree? So people who care about science show this decrease. We also found the same thing, and I'm, I'm going to run out of time to show you all the figures, uh, with identification. And so all of these types of things tend to be highly correlated. If you trust your country, you trust your leaders, you trust scientists who are speaking on behalf of, of uh the country, you're more, you're more likely to reduce your distance and engage in uh, less mobility. Um, and so what this suggests across measures of actual behavior at the national level and measures of uh, self-report is that national identification predicts all measures of public health support that we looked at. Um, so that's a good effect of identification of social identity. Um, but when you have countries where there's polarization or when you have leaders of different identity groups, who downplay the risks uh, or role model the wrong type of activity. Like uh, here's an example of a picture from the Supreme Court nomination. This was it turned out to be a super spreader event uh, at the White House. So when the, you're doing these types of things, violating the, your own national guidelines and CDC guidelines, um, that can lead to bad public health outcomes. And so here, you, the people who've been colored in end up getting COVID from this event, they think. Um, I just want to clarify something. The primary mechanism of transmission of COVID is uh, aerosol. And so um, I suspect that this was not from the outdoor gathering here in the garden at the White House. I suspect it was from indoor where they had a party afterwards. And you can see pictures of almost all these people uh, who are in color indoors chit-chatting without masks. And I'm guessing that that's, that there's higher probability um, that that's where they got COVID at this event than outdoors. Um, just wanted to clarify that. I don't want, want to show an image that misleads about your own personal risks. If you can get together with people, do it outdoors. Um, and so this is kind of the, the potentially opportunity here when you are an identity leader and the potential uh, downside and risks. Um, and again, it didn't have to be this way. And so uh, New Zealand is one example of where it was done well, but another place where they actually did a really good study on this was uh, just north of the border in Canada. And so Canada is very polarized. In fact, it's been getting more and more polarized like the US. It's not as bad, but they have a look prompt. Their two biggest parties are a liberal party and a conservative party. And you might have, and they're at, at each other's throats most of the time politically. Um, you might have expected, and Canada is a similar size to the US, um, similar culture. 
And you might expect, well, that's going to polarization is going to lead to disaster there. Um, but these political scientists published this really nice paper where they went in and analyzed, went online and analyzed the rhetoric and language about the pandemic from uh, conservative and liberal leaders in Canada in the start of the pandemic. And what they found is that they were talking about it in a serious way, no matter what party they were from. And so both parties, even though they disagree on a lot of things, agreed about the severity of the pandemic and risks invo involved. And then when these uh, researchers did national surveys, they found that uh, Canadians from both sides of the political aisle, liberal and conservative, both took the pandemic seriously. Um, and so this is a case where you have a polarized environment that politically is incredibly similar to the US and uh, they didn't polarize the issue of the pandemic even though they're polarized on many other issues. And so in other words, it didn't have to be the case if our leaders here had, had uh, done the same thing, in my opinion. And that's what the data suggests. Um, there was an analysis from Penn Medical School uh, by, I think it was Zico Emanuel, and they looked at what would have happened to the death rate in the US if, if the US had handled the pandemic just as well as Canada did. And they found that it would have been over 100,000 less deaths. And that, and that paper came out, I believe, in October. Um, at this point, it would probably account for two or 300,000 fewer deaths if it was handled just simply as well as Canada. So this gives you a sense of the consequences of turning this into a divisive polarized issue. Um, and this is like a map, a heat map, just of, of all the cases of COVID. And you can just see such a radical difference between the US and Canada. Um, so that's all I really have to say, um, just that there's often an opportunity to manage collective behavior in a more effective way to say, and in this case, it could have saved probably hundreds of thousands of lives. Hard to, it's a really hard number to wrap your mind around. Um, anyways, uh, I'll wrap up there and take questions. I just wanna say that we have a website you can go to here and we're gonna be making all our data available as soon as our paper's published, which with, with cross your fingers, maybe in a, in a month or two or, or maybe more. Um, and you can analyze them to your heart's desire because we included all kinds of different measures uh, with a huge samples in many countries. You can analyze them for research on COVID. You could cross correlate them with in, uh, national measures on other variables. Um, whatever your research question is, uh, we're trying to make it available so people can use it. So um, it'll be made available very soon. Um, so thank you. And I'm happy to stop there and I'll turn over to Daryl who will navigate the um, Q&A. Uh, thank you. That was really, really illuminating and interesting. And I'm hopeful we get a number of questions from the audience. We do already have one question. Um, so this is from Hasib, who wanted to know if uh, the type of data, now I assume this is just in general, if, um, perhaps clarify if, there's, if you want to qualify which yeah. data you're referring to, but is the type of data, I presume, on public health engagement or mobility available for the United Kingdom on partisanship differences? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I suspect it is. So we had to get ours from like a, a mobile company and then we had to like file a question, you know, request to get their data and only use it for research. Um, but I do have a collaborator who's getting the same data and replicating our study with the mobility data with the, with the smartphones in Brazil right now because he suspects the same things happening in Brazil. So I would assume you get it in the UK and I would love to, if you would do it and if you could get it and tell me what the results are because as you know, the UK is incredibly polarized. Um, especially around the Brexit issue. And another, th and the UK, I'll say another thing about the UK, the Brazil and the US at one point in the pandemic uh, were the, hand the three countries in the world that were handling it the worst. I think they had the highest death rates. And they not only are polarized, but they also have at that time, all of uh, highly populist style leaders. And populism comes with often a distrust of uh, elites and, and authorities, including experts and, and medical, uh, you know, public health experts. And so, that would be a great, all three of them kind of are triumvirate also of this type of particular leadership style um, that the, where the consequences I think were absolutely devastating. So I, I love it if you would do that research and please do email me if you find something. So Maria says, no question, but thank you for an amazing and fascinating presentation. Thanks Maria, <laughs> I appreciate uh, the kind words. And Hasim follow up and said that this is what we're thinking how the Brexit how Brexit has complicated the issue yet further. Thank you for a spectacular webinar and leadership on this research. We'll email you. Thanks, Hasim. And I look forward to your research. Um, Rhea asks, in addition to saying this is super interesting, uh, 
do you think there's a way for the partisan rhetoric in the U.S. to change, or is it too late? I know it's something we've we've chatted about before, like yeah. looking at some of the the data you're presenting on partisanship. You know, what are some mechanisms you might try to address? Yeah, so I'm I'm I, I wrote a paper on this. It was the um, one by led by Eli Finkel and uh, Jamie Druckmann. It was published in Science in, two, in this fall, and we have a section at the end about like thinking about ways to mi minimize. Uh, what we think of as the polarization in the U.S. has reached a level that we term sectarianism because it's so much about d disdain for the other group and um, and moralization that the other side is not just wrong that they're evil. And in those types of cases, you get in what looks like intractable conflict, and that's kind of hinted at, I think, in your question where you said, "Is it too late?" Um, so I, I certainly don't think it's too late at all. Um, so we have some suggestions, maybe ways to improve it. Um, and I'm digging out, that's kind of a big thing that my lab is trying to do. And, and I don't wanna say that people shouldn't disagree politically. Um, what we're talking about is affective polarization. I actually think that you know, um, ideological polarization is fine. If you're debating about issues or civil rights issues or something, there, there is a very good place for that. Um, what you have with affective polarization is if you won't listen to the other side, even if you would otherwise agree with their position. And so we think that's the part that is more uh, malignant. Um, and so, so we're, we're doing a lot of things to do it, but I think we, you know, we all have to do what we can, but I think misinformation, I do a lot of research on misinformation, fake news, conspiracy theories. I think that's one of the first things you can do is to that kind of fans the flames of a lot of disdain and hatred for the other side. And so we're thinking that that might be the first place where you can start to operate through things like social media. Um, and in fact, there's a really cool study by Hunt Alcott and some economists where they pay people to go off Facebook for a few weeks uh, versus go on it. And they found that the ones who went off it uh, and they randomly assigned them, so it was a great experiment, were less polarized. They were also happier and all these other great things, but they were less polarized. And so we have to think of how we interact with, with these platforms, I think is gonna be really important. Great. So uh, more that's really interesting and especially how to, how to decenter political identity some degree. Um, a number of questions have rolled in on the basis of that. Um, so let's see. Um, I mean, Philippe asks about the role of money and funding in politics, if it might incentivize polarization, and also how that intersects with the social media question and response you were mentioning. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I'm Canadian, so I didn't say that. <laughs> so I have a conflict of interest presenting the Canadian data as if it's good. Um, so I do think that that's a big difference between our countries is that there's incredible money in politics and gerrymandering here. And I think that foregrounds the interests of powerful rich people over citizens and incentivizes highly polarized figures uh, in ways that are probably not healthy for uh, functioning democracy. So I think that that's one of the first things you could do in the, in the US, and this is obviously a huge debate right now, is democratic reform expanding opportunity to vote to as many people as possible, minimizing as much uh, dark money, especially as you can, um, and uh, getting rid of gerrymandering. And that way, the people who are elected in are gonna reflect the broad interests of the places in which they live. And so I, I have a lot more faith in the average citizen. I think that the average citizen's voice here is, is uh, suppressed in some pretty bad ways. Yeah, so that, um... That's, I mean, see, yeah, certainly thinking about structural influences like that is important. Um, a few different sorts of questions and trying to more rolling in quickly. Um, one by uh, Don, and also uh, folks, if you're uh, if you're thinking of Q and A, just make sure to use the Q and A function at the bottom. We're not we're not doing the, the hand raise thing just for this format. So if you have questions, please just type them into the Q and A. Um, so Don asks if in these analyses, if we consider the literature on social and political solidarity as it pertains to public health. Yeah, I mean, that ended up, we had some experts on that. We had several people in political science, sociology, um, and also social psychology in our, in our original kind of overarching theory paper at the start of our, our line of work. And they talked a lot about, and that's why I think where the identity leadership model comes from it. There are certain ways of using language that promote solidarity, there are certain ways of building a trust at the community level. So this was something that was key for uh, addressing Ebola in Africa. So we had some colleagues who were public health experts who had studied that. And, um, and a lot of that was done by like 
through your local parishion or parish, sorry. Um, so local religious leaders, community leaders, mayors, um, school leaders. And so that's often how people identify and have a sense of community. And so you can often get them to come, people who are maybe don't trust broad institutions to comply. And I think that's gonna be really key for the vaccine effort because we're about to go from a tipping point of everybody wants the vaccine and no one can get it. I think in about a month, maybe six weeks, we're gonna flip where, a nut, where we're gonna start to hit the vaccine hesitancy point of the American population. And the challenge is gonna go from how do we get it to people into their arms to and produce enough to how do we convince vaccine hesitant people to actually go get their vaccine? And so that's another point where I think you're going to have to think about how do you get into these, uh, especially Republican areas, and build a sense of shared purpose and solidarity, and also get their medical practitioners on, excuse me, on boards to help them get vaccinated because it's in everybody's best interest. I mean, one of the most interesting things about doing research during the pandemic is just how the pandemic itself—it's an evolving historical event, and so. Yeah. You know, the data that people were getting March and April of last year versus behavioral science data that rolling in right now, very different questions afford themselves. Yeah, yeah. Like it's, hard to stay, it's hard to stay on top of it. Like in a month, things change. So there are some other questions. Um, I mean, with respect to, there's two broad categories of questions I'm seeing. One is about features of leaders and how they motivate behavior. Another is about contingencies in different places. Let me go to the former of those first. So Zenev asks us, and this connects to the idea of like how do different leaders and cultures like facilitate the behavior in question. Uh, Zenev wants to know to what degree a country that has an authoritarian regime could moderate population behaviors toward distancing and other COVID prevention sorts of actions. Yeah, so I, I am not a fan of authoritarianism. It's something that always has bugged me even since I was a little kid. I hated authoritarian style teachers and principal. Um, but, I, but I will say, um, unfortunately, there, there is some evidence that authoritarianism can work in these short situations. And so if you look at our data, one of the top countries where national identification predicted public health, uh, support for public health measures was China. And China's an uh, authoritarian regime and what they did was they completely locked. I mean, I, I, it's always, I always am skeptical of the data coming from China, but, uh, and obviously they were the origin of this, but they completely locked down and managed it really well uh, afterwards because they're able to do that and they're centrally organized. Um, I think that might be, and, and there's some work, and I don't want to call this authoritarianism, but there's work by uh, one of our colleagues, um, Michelle Gelfand and others, who's a cultural psychologist who finds that tight cultures, which is like they have tight social norms and your uh, freedom is constrained socially, uh, or better at managing the pandemic. I think they had a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine or the Lancet uh, looking at this at the national level. So there is, and that's not quite authoritarianism, but it correlates, I think, with authoritarian style nations. So there is some evidence that that can be effective. Uh, of course, you need a competent authoritarian. If you have a populist authoritarian who doesn't listen to the science, then the prediction would be the exact opposite. So related to yeah. this, on the same topic of leadership, um, it's there are so many interesting questions rolling in. I'll try to field them um, as best I can here. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I think uh, one of them from, from Rhea, she uh, asks, well, so taking this in the context of different leadership styles, so let, me, let me summarize a couple of different questions from different people. So Shannon is saying, do we have any, do you have any data or intuition about whether making rhetoric from leaders from other countries more salient, like New Zealand, could persuade people to follow suit, particularly, uh, she suggests, in moderately democratic areas under Trump's leadership, and would this somehow correlate with country identification? Yeah, I mean, one thing you, you so most leaders, I, I like to assume, have the best of intentions, and they want to get better. I mean, I, I make, I have, I'm a pretty optimistic person about human nature. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong, a lot of human nature a lot of the time, but my assumption is most leaders want that. And so if you were a leader, whether it's at the state level, federal level, local level, you should look to leaders who've been effective and adopt their tactics and strategies. And in fact, I hope there's a lot of literature that comes out of this that benefits people who train leaders and at public policy schools where they're training leaders. Um, whether leaders will follow their um, 
that type of model probably depends on if they're if they're trying to improve or they're threatened to buy it. And so you saw Trump's response to Jacinda Ardern, and he publicly criticized her for her approach and claimed it was a failure. So, because her approach is so different from his that it reflected badly on his performance. So I, I think you're always gonna get some leaders who are resistant or in fact reactive against that. Um, but I, I do think it, to us, it just fits with the literature. I use it as an example because it fits so closely with what the literature on identity leadership suggests. Um, I will say one of the findings in the identity leadership that's really nice about identity rhetoric, it was done in Australia over, I think it was like a hundred years of federal elections uh, by, by Stephens and um, Nick and uh, Alex Haslam. And they found that leaders who use collective pronouns in their speeches, public speeches, like we, us, uh, were more likely to get elected. And so there's a lot at stake for leaders. If they can use this effectively, it benefits them politically. And also if they can do it to mobilize people's behavior in a crisis like this, it can benefit their citizens. So th there is good reason to believe that, that that rhetoric is successful in all kinds of contexts and should be modeled. Yeah, and I think one, one thing I'm seeing in some of these questions further is the degree to which, you know, you have, you have different leadership examples that you, you talked about in your presentation. And given social media usage, people have these different models of what it means to be responsible during the pandemic. And so I think people, a lot of the questions here, there's another one from Muhammad about um, the situation in France, for example, where the leader is not a populist, but some leaders, especially um, a certain medical professor seem to push for similar attitudes to Trump. Yeah. Um, another question from Brea asks about like the Biden administration and how Biden's handling might differ um, with, with, especially with regard to attitudes towards the pandemic and the minimization of polarization. And so I don't know if either of those questions you'd want to field. Um, so the first question uh, by Mohammed. I, so I, I, I want to admit that I'm not intimately uh, aware of France, although I do know that they're currently, I think, in a disaster type situation, maybe a fourth wave. And, and, um, and I know, in my opinion, and this is a controversial opinion, my understanding of Europe right now is that they've mishandled the AstraZeneca vaccine and probably thousands of people, tens of thousands of people are going to die because of that. So um, there's lots, there's, it's not to say that there's, that, you know, Europe has done better than the US in many ways in many parts of the pandemic, but there's many places where it's been badly handled. And there was a very famous medical doctor there who I think it was the hydrochloroquine uh, research that was really flimsy. And if you looked at the data, it was really flimsy. It wasn't well controlled in small samples. Um, and it took off and Trump, I think, used it or as a kind of a, a miracle cure. Um, so I do think that there are countries that are outliers. I don't know if, if, I, if France fits our model or not. So there can be democratic leaders who fail, um, who aren't populist and many have. Um, I think one of the things you do see here is that we have a global crisis and, and everybody's kind of going through it. Obviously some countries have more resources than others, um, but it's kind of one of those rare moments where you can see the consequences of leadership style in real time, in a short period, and it's measured in deaths. Whereas normally it's hard to figure out if a leader was good or not, did the economy grow because of their policies or broader factors in the, in the global economy or because of the Senate or Congress or previous tax cuts or policies. Um, and so it's really hard to normally attribute successes to leaders. It's like what historians spend a lot of time trying to figure out. Um, I think here you have a, a really concrete way of looking at leadership styles and their success or failure. And to me, what, what's more powerful is not looking at a single leader. I use a couple as examples, but looking at these kind of global trends and getting data from 40 or 50 or 60 countries and measuring what variables you think matter and seeing, do they predict success on the type of dimensions that you care about. Um, so, so that would be my approach to figuring it out. And Philippe also mentions, obviously, um, China has massive human rights violations. So yeah, I, I don't wanna say that they, that I, again, I don't support authoritarianism at all um, or genocide. I, I, I'm just saying that in terms of managing the specific question of the pandemic, that, that they've been reasonably effective. A couple of the remaining questions. Uh, one is, again, appealing to a specific case about Switzerland and how anything you might know about how they've managed in relation to the political structure. Um, yeah, so I, I have a, one, my postdocs was supposed to come here and she's in Switzerland. And um, so I know a little bit through her because she's 
been doing her postdoc virtually from Switzerland the entire time and not able to come to New York. And so Switzerland is an interesting country because it has really positive collective outcomes. Uh, obviously, it's a very wealthy country for, for many reasons. Um, but they have a lot of positive health outcomes that, that are parallel to the social democracies of uh, Scandinavia. Um, and yet they're much more like a, like a free market based system. So they're uh, kind of an interesting case, uh, normally like pretty successful in a lot of different uh, dimensions of quality of life and so forth. Um, at first they were managing it well, but, but I, I think uh, recently that they've, they've slipped like a lot of countries have. Um, so I don't know enough about the specific details what their current case rates are or anything like that, but but kind of just maybe Switzerland is one of those cases where they've done well and then done badly. Uh, you're kind of seeing the flip right now because the vaccines are starting to, there's almost an opposite effect right now of the vaccines, which is where um, the US and the UK and Israel in particular got access to high quality vaccination very early and distributed it very effectively and have flattened the curve and the death rates are plummeting in all those places. Um, even though they, mishandled the pandemic throughout most of the rest of the, the, the previous year. Um, obviously the US has very different leadership now, but the other countries don't. And so um, it becomes hard now to do an apples to apples comparison about leadership um, because it's a really different variable and, and uh, your access to the vaccine is gonna account for so much variance and things like mortality, especially if you give it to elderly people first. So this is where like managing collective behaviors in, in my view is kind of like, a it's a different type of questions about getting people vaccinated, but it is hard to do those comparisons. We, at this point in some countries do cross country comparisons uh, if some countries are getting the vaccine two or three months earlier or have access to better vaccines like Moderna and Pfizer. And that might relate to the, the, the last question I see here at the moment from Stefan, which is about how in places of the European Union, some of the decisions and actions about vaccines are hand, handled supranationally. Um, and so essentially taking things up another level, how do you consider when you have multiple national interests involved? Does that further complicate the question? Yeah, I mean, this is one of the problems with the EU right now and the AstraZeneca vaccination problem. And it's uh, ironically, I mean, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of reasons to despise the Brexit uh, situation. Um, one unusual consequence is they've been able to control the number of vaccines that they get. Um, during a period where it mattered a great deal and it's saving an enormous number of lives. So, so and Europe is complex because I, I forget who was the first person to ban the Astra or to pause the vaccinations with AstraZeneca, maybe it was Denmark or maybe it was France. Um, but then there was a wave of other EU countries that, that did it, um, even though 70 other nations had approved it and were vaccinating with it. So you do have identities at multiple levels and I think in many cases it can be very helpful, uh, in, in, you know, for promoting uh, exchanges and tolerance between people from different countries. You know, maybe one of the reasons why we haven't had a World War III is because Europe has carved out a different identity as an EU, um, and it created interdependence economically and socially and culturally between these countries. Um, but at this particular moment, like in the last two weeks, it's been a bad. I think bad, bad has bad consequences. The following just adds to your note that Denmark and Norway were the first to ban, but Austria, for instance, didn't do that, but also suffers a decrease of trust. Yes, I, I saw, yeah, Michael Bang Peterson had a vaccine hesitancy uh, study in the field and found out that all those adjacent EU countries plummeted, some of them 10, 20, 30 points in trust. France plummeted a lot. Um, so even if they still give, even if you, you were giving out the AstraZeneca vaccine, and decided that it's actually not that dangerous and that it's gonna benefit far more people than it's gonna harm and you kept giving it, the fact that your neighbor's bandit is gonna increase hesitancy among people who are might be inclined to distrust medical authorities or vaccines. So it, I think that's just uh, in many ways the absolute worst possible situation because unless the, the data comes out that shows that it is more harmful than the potential benefits, which I highly doubt it is, um, that it's gonna be devastating for vaccine hesitancy, as well as missing two to three weeks or four weeks of the most vulnerable people in your country is getting vaccinated. And so this is all collective behavior, shared identities, spillover effects. A lot of it is psychological, how you perceive the risk to you based on this information you're getting from people in adjacent countries.
so I think there's, um, yeah, I think some of the, Philippe has another question about the, I think leadership styles, I think it, perhaps you broadly covered it, um, unless there's anything else you care to say about it. Yeah, there, um, there, um, Philippe mentions another thing that these are uh, New Zealand and Finland, both young women with different styles, different outcomes. Um, there was an initial analysis that suggested that gender of leadership, that women leaders were, were more successful. But then I saw reanalysis of that data suggest that it was confounded with a couple other things, including like uh, act, act, physical access to the country or something. So it's really hard with, with some of these analyses at this point to isolate what it is. But um, Finland and New Zealand are also like high, they're scored very high on human development index, high on public education, high on trust in institutions. So there's obviously other factors there, but, but it's, it is also nice to note that there's different types of leadership styles that can be effective. Um, and, and there's always gonna be like context effects, right? Like as you move to different cultures, different leadership styles are gonna work, you know, the same person in a different culture might not be as effective. So yeah, a ton of great questions. Has Asib uh, just says, thank you for Thanks, helping us understand the complexity of this. Uh, for those of you who are interested in this afterwards, there's gonna be a recording posted on the Rock Ethics YouTube channel that David Price, our, our strategic communications guru is uh, helping to orchestrate all of this. I suppose like one question or broad question I have as we sort of wrap things up, though if others do have questions, please feel free to pitch them by all means. Um, so I mean, thinking back to the broader context of empathizing, I know there's some work on empathy as it relates to some of the initial pandemic relevant behaviors such as distancing and, and mask wearing. And I'm curious if, I mean, I know you have prior work on empathy gaps in intergroup contexts, and I have some work as well about empathy and the large scale suffering and gaps there. In motivating people to care about further engagement, we hear about pandemic fatigue, we hear about people deciding it's time to, to open up and everything. One lesson from the talk today is that these different layers of identity, and I think people are bringing up all these the complex different layers and sub layers that we could identify with our country or our subgroup or political identity, other sorts of identities we inhabit. How do you, I guess, how do you see people sifting through those identities? Like clearly the ones they focus on seem to matter in different ways for polarization, for, for vaccination hesitancy and so forth. Like what are some ways we could try to encourage people? And this does go to a question someone had about, which was wonderful, it's wonderful like a big picture question from Jacqueline, you know, what's the solution? Uh, so what, how do we get, how do we help people uh, sift through these different identities? And does something like empathy help play a role or is it sort of a double-edged sword? Yeah, um, I mean, I think empathy is complex. Obviously, like you said, it's, it can be a bit of a double-edged sword, but I think in a crisis, um, it can be very helpful because it motivates you to care about people that you might not otherwise care for and to hopefully expand your circle of empathy. And so I, I think that empathy here, and I, I don't know what the data is on this, um, but I, I think that we, we do have some data that I didn't present that people who think of morality as cooperation that are more willing to think of like, the key to morality is to cooperate and help others, which is related, I think, to empathy. Um, we're all, that was one of our best predictors of uh, over and above, you know, in addition to these identity effects of people's willingness to engage in these public health measures and these sacrifices. And you saw amazing acts of kindness in the pandemic. Um, so I do think that, uh, that expanding your circle of empathy, and I think that's, again, kind of I'll go back to the New Zealand versus US example. That was the New Zealand approach, that we're all in this together we're not gonna carve up into political parties as we think about how to tackle this. And we're all gonna make sacrifices and try to help one another and pull through. And if we all do it, we all benefit. And, that, and that's what has happened to them. Um, versus I don't like the other side or maybe, and I saw a lot of rhetoric like this on, I could have a whole talk probably where I just pulled quotes from social media among, um, from Democrats and Republicans every time something bad happened to their side. So in the early stages, you know, and this was part of the policy of the Trump administration was not providing resources to uh, states that didn't support Trump. Um, and I think Jared Kushner was, was involved in that. And so um, that is like a lack of empathy for people who are suffering. I, mean, I think it was leaked that Jared Kushner said they're not our voters anyways. And so they're not a priority. 
And so that type of lack of empathy is troubling. And then, then I've seen the opposite. I've seen some Democrats, you know, that Republicans aren't getting vaccinated now and they're just like, screw them, they can suffer. Um, but I think there's a broad understanding if you're gonna live in a society with other people that especially like a complex pluralistic diverse society and, and a liberal democracy where we wanna accept differences that, that it matters to try to figure out ways to get through to the other side and help them. And, and I'll say there's some data on this I saw last week with Anthony Fauci went on Fox News and it turns out Fox News viewers who see Anthony Fauci talking about so the right behaviors during the pandemic are more likely to do them. So I don't think you can just write off the people who watch these shows who are different than you or live in a different part of the country as you as, as irredeemable. Um, I think there still needs to be that effort to treat them as humans and try to figure out a way to, to get through and help them because everybody benefits when we do. Well, it certainly is a complex challenge. And um, especially, I mean, from what you're saying, I mean, it seems like people are deriving a lot of satisfaction from their political identities in various ways that might self be rewarding and motivate, incentivize certain kinds of like further fracturing and polarization. Yeah. It is, I mean, it is, um, it is interesting to consider. Um, oh boy, my cat's scratching at the door. <laughs> It'll be interesting. So um, I guess one question as I go open the door so my cat doesn't break through the glass is, what about so Walter asks about you for you're focusing very much of this talk, which yeah. rightly so on like strong Democrats, Republicans, liberals, conservatives. Um, what about independents and people who are a little bit less par partisan and identified? Yeah, so so Walter makes a great point. Uh, we have been focusing on people who are highly identified as part of the theme. And and I will say for people who want to get into the solutions piece of some of this stuff, I, I will give a plug. I have a book that's coming that just is about to come out, finishing it next week. Uh, it's called The Power of Us, and it talks about all the different strategies for helping bring people together to build solidarity and cooperate. So if you're interested in these issues and want kind of a pop science book, um, you can probably go to my website or just search for it on Amazon and, and order it if you're interested. Um, but on this issue of um, independence, so if you look at, for example, the vaccines, independence are in the middle um, in terms of vaccine hesitancy. And th they're kind of people, the independence, are not necessarily not ideological. So they still might be democratic leaning or Republican leaning. Um, and so many of them actually have a, an identification or preference with the group, they're just not registered. So that's part of it. Um, for people who don't have a strong preference, a lot of them are low political information consumers. So they just don't follow politics. They don't like it. They're sick of hearing about it. Um, there's one survey suggesting they're the kind of, you know, exhausted majority of in a polarized environment that they account for a lot of people. And a lot of Lot, fewer people are identifying as political parties these days than before. So, um, so independents are, are a huge group. And um, again, some of them kind of have the, there's research showing that if you measure implicit measures of their identity, some of them have identities and that predicts what they vote for, but many of them don't. And so I, I like to think of independents probably in some ways as um, less likely to harbor partisan bias, less likely to have affective partis polarization and partisanship towards outgroup, uh, political outgroups, um, less likely to make politics a big part of their identity, um, possibly more open-minded to information that, that's polarized um, because they don't have like kind of a, an elite that they're following telling them how to interpret it. Um, but they also, as I said, tend to be lower information consumers. So they might not be as aware of certain political debates and policies and consequences. So there's some, some advantages for independence and some disadvantages in terms of managing a pandemic. And just a last couple of points. I mean, Philippe asks about with that also other third parties like libertarians as another example. Yeah, libertarians interesting because um, John Haidt has data on, on the morality of libertarians and they really score highly conservative on some measures of libertarianism uh, and highly liberal on others. <laughs> um, you know, if you want social freedoms, libertarians benefit from kind of liberal or leftist platforms. If they want um, economic freedom, they benefit from or prefer conservative platforms or policies. So libertarians end up being like a really interesting thing. The main thing they just value is freedom <laughs> above all else. Um, I actually think that's probably in a pandemic, a dangerous ideology. Libertarian 
libertarianism has lots of benefits and other consequences. Um, but I think that in a pandemic, just valuing freedom about all, above all else, where if all of us took that stance during the pandemic um, and didn't want to compromise any of our freedoms, we would have, you know, probably instead of 550,000 Americans dead, probably a, a million or more. Um, and there's models of this, if, how many people follow the guidelines. So it kind of depends on, on the circumstances. I'm always kind of, I, as you can tell, I'm a social psychologist, always the, the type of belief system, if it's going to be effective or not, depends on the circumstance that they're in. Um, libertarians, it's, I don't know what their vac vaccination has not rated. I'd be very interested because for me, I also, part of what I, why I want to get vaccinated is not just to protect others, my family, but to have freedom to do the things I love to do again. I want to go on trips. I want to see my family. Um, I want to go to restaurants and eat or go to a movie or see my friends. And so to me, uh, like wearing a mask or having a vaccine is a, partly one of the reasons I do it is it's a vehicle to freedom. So I don't. I so I also think that part of the way we message and market these things should think about the psychology of people like libertarians and think of like how do you frame it so that people like that find it compelling and are more willing to do it uh, so that they can achieve those parts of their identity. So yeah, I think that's really fascinating uh, to consider. And just the last couple points, and then we'll wrap up. So Muhammad doesn't add that for the UK. Some of the some of the variation in how the vaccination program was rolled out with you know first dose only for a while and AstraZeneca issues um, mixed messaging as a potential inhibitor to vaccine uptake and contributing to hesitancy. Um, yeah, and then Rhea just mentions that, um, and this connects to I think a nice concluding question more broadly, which is just you know you noted early in your talk how oftentimes you see there needs to be this like shared factual reality. And yeah. so you would think that especially as you noted early on people, you, you thought people would really, everyone would solidify together, come together because there's this big massive crisis event where so many people are dying. Yeah. Um, and Rhea is just curious how polarization inserted itself here in a way that at least it seems like looking back historically, we people did come together more and bridge across and had this common in group identity, right? And so, I think just is what in particular about this event lends itself to that sort of partisan polarization? Yeah, I think part of it is um, it got polarized very early. So I think part of it was this, the parsimonious explanation is that it was going to be bad for Trump's economy and for him to run for re-election or, or he didn't want to acknowledge potential failure or, or harm to people um, during the election year. So it's very close to election. And so then he downplayed the risks. And then once Republicans and Republican media saw it through a low risk lens, that's kind of a parsimonious explanation for everything that came after, right? Because if you don't think it's a big risk. And I trust me, I have family members who are telling me it's like the flu, right? We have tons of data, it's not the flu. Um, you know, 500,000 people don't die from the flu each year. Um, so if you don't think it's risk, then you don't think it's a need to engage in distancing or stop your Thanksgiving or you know Christmas event with your family. You don't think you need to stop going for dinner inside. Um, so those are the types of things that also maybe you don't want to wear a mask because you don't think it's a big deal. You think it's been overblown. You don't want to get a vaccine because there's going to be side effects of the vaccine. It's not worth it when you're when the actual risk of the pandemic is made up or overstated by the media. And so. I think that that is kind of like uh, that um, framing, and that's why I often show that video clip, planted the seed for the rest of the pandemic in the US. And now you're a year later, you're like 15 months later from those first video clips, and you're still seeing the consequences of that kind of framing of the risk factor involved. So I think that's, that's part, of, part of it. And then it's really hard to unwind once you've got that in people's head. Because then if they don't trust mainstream media, if they don't trust experts, if they don't trust public health officials, it's gonna be hard to convince them to do any of the collective behaviors necessary for reducing the pandemic. And especially because people have become so empathically numb once as the numbers have gotten to the phase they are, I mean, to the degree that identity-based motivational inhibitors just layer on that, it further creates risk. Well, this is this is like your research on the identifi identifiable victim, right? It's like, you know, that old Stalin quote, you know, one death is a tragedy, a million is a statistic. We're like at half a million. Yeah. Well, 
yeah, thank you uh, for visiting us. I think we're going to go ahead and wrap it up um, for today. But you know, for anybody, again, anybody who has any further questions, feel free to reach out to Dr. Van Bobel. Um, and the, the talk will be archived in the Rock Ethics Institute YouTube site. Um, yeah, it's been great. I mean, I've known you for a, a while now. And so it's great to have you uh, visit here at Penn State and help us you know, think about all the complexities that are, and tragedies that are involved in navigating through this pandemic. And thanks everyone for your great questions. And thanks, Philippe, for the kind words. Thanks everyone for joining me.